experimental physics, and because of my long-standing interest in evolutionism, I designed an experiment, the results of which I will share with you today in a video format. The first part of this talk, I will speak as a scientist. But then because the cultural impact of Darwinism is so large, for the second part, I will speak as a fellow citizen and discuss Darwinism in light of our political founding, in light of what the Declaration of Independence states is the self-evidence that all men are created equal. The definition of evolution, according to Wikipedia and the textbooks, is a change in gene frequency over time. But this definition does not give us a metric. How can we de determine if we are seeing evolution if we don't have a metric? Say some monkey kind evolves to some mankind, we would say there was a change in gene frequency. And say some mankind devolved to some sort of knuckle dragger, we would also say that there was a change in gene frequency. So one would think that were a scientist to have an experiment, that he would examine his hypotheses and be, have the ability to discriminate between the prevailing hypotheses and his polar opposite, at least, in order to determine if this experiment is going to work. Why is it that if a sixth grader has as his science project metric things happen, that we would fail them? But when academia, Hollywood, and our political class commit the same intellectual crime, they grant themselves honorary and bona fide doctrines. Notice, what if we stumbled across a scientific lab book and it said, day one, a leaf fell from a tree. So something happened. Day two, a car drove by. Something happened again. I must be proving some wonderful science. This is, this is transparent and foolish. The theory of, of evolution needs to be repaired with a definition of evolution that includes an information metric. This will allow us to evaluate a whole host of physical phenomena, be they in the biological realm, or in my case, in the sandcastle realm. Another advantage of such a definition is that it respects, instead of fights, the exceptionless thermodynamic nature by which nature operates. Let's qualitatively give a couple of definitions. We define evolution or evolution as a natural process whereby information is gained. In line of information theory, we could also say that the entropy of their object of interest has decreased, or colloquially, the randomness associated with this object has decreased. Conversely, we define devolution to be a natural process by which information is destroyed. Conversely, the entropy and the randomness will have increased. So we ask, with a theory of evolution repaired along these lines, is there any evidence out there to suggest that evolutionism is valid? Darwin observed that finches with narrow beaks were better able to get bugs out of the tree and have a differential reproductive advantage over their wider beak cousins. Natural selection was shown to create daughter populations that could be so divergent that they could no longer interbreed. This observation emboldened evolutionists. But speciation 
by uh, speciation by uh, natural processes only is the only occurs because of the genetic information already present in the parent generations. Natural selection just suppresses some of that and allows other of this already present information to emerge. So natural selection is devolutionary in nature and not evolutionary in nature. So uh, in uh, 1920, 1929, Leo Silliard wrote a tremendous paper, and in the way of his paper, to describe natural, to associate natural selection with evolution is a scientific anachronism. One of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century is that information is physical and that there is a thermodynamic cost to the generation of information. So our knowledge of genetics teaches us that natural selection is devolutionary and not evolutionary. And our knowledge of the thermodynamic nature of information informs us of the, of the consistent way that na nature never creates net information. If anything, nature is a destroyer of information. So in the progression from pond scum to homo sapiens, there needs to be an ocean of information creation. But in the entire annals, annals of evolutionary evidence, there is not evidence for one drop of information creation. So the information is, is key to understanding the way nature works. And the human genome is composed of amino acids. We can make both left and right-handed amino acids in the laboratory. However, the human genome is composed exclusively of left-handed amino acids. So the odds of th this, this homogeneity of amino acids is akin to a coin, top of, coin toss experiment with an unweighted coin where heads is achieved 10 billion times in a row. And this does not even include the codon information, which is the real information that determines who, who we are. So compared to this coin toss experiment, Getting a very ornate sandcastle to form by throwing a handful of sand is a sure bet. <laughs> Can you play the video, please?
we could get a sand castle to form, uh, to form from a pile of sand. And we wanted to have that victory celebration, but full disclosure, we played the, the data backwards. But the point of the video just complements what I've been saying, and that when we play the video, the true video, forward in time, we only see devolution. When we play the video backward in time, we only see evolution. Our, this video, this data, our experiences, our talk, discussion of information and probability, it suggests that evolutionism could not be more wrong. So while we have sketched a modified theory of evolution, a more rigorous theory would need to quantitatively account for the progression from pond scum to homo sapiens and account for the information creation along this whole sequence. <coughs> but one thing that is apparent by the video and such is that time is the foe and not the friend of evolution. Our founding fathers contrasted the complexity which they saw with the destructive powers of nature. And they made the, the perhaps obvious but nonetheless profound conclusion that, that we are created. Whereas our founding fathers were farmers who negotiated with nature and nature's God in order to in order to turn a profit in the free market, today's politicians gain their wages by collaborating with a group of hyphenated Americans against others in order to deny Americans of their unable rights by the bidding of the highest voting block. Whereas our founding fathers had their understanding of self-evidence sharpened by the need to provide for their families by working with nature and deriving from nature their livelihood, today's politicians are intellectually and ideologically disconnected from this origin. Today's politicians create a Heather has two mommies world as they wax on in their PowerPoint reality and they wage war against nature and nature's God. Our polity violates our right to life, our right to liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. If you look at the less than 50% of U.S. households that pay income tax, their rights to liberty and pursuit of happiness is conspicuously denied. To argue otherwise, one would have to assert three points, all of which are absurd. One is that this scrapper goes to work because he'd prefer to go to work at his job than to leisure. Or that this scrapper would work even without financial compensation. Okay. Or thirdly, that this scrapper has no need for the money that he's earning. These, these three claims are absurd. If these are not absurd to Americans, then the American self-evident experiment has failed. It is important to recover a sense of the self-evidence about nature and nature's God if we are to continue in this experiment of self-governance. We began by seeing that the definition of evolution prohibits intellectual thought. Next we saw that devolutionary claims are stolen and used as evidence for evolution. But there is a huge silver lining in our experiment. By recognizing the limits of natural processes, we find 
that we are something special. We find that we are not the product of time <coughs> and slot. We find that we are given information by someone who's very knowledgeable. And we find that we are given human rights, including unable rights, by someone who cares very deeply for us.